What's up everyone, Matt Horspool here, adventure travel photographer and Olympus ambassador based in Sydney, Australia. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to create a video on underwater photography because it has been one of my most requested topics uh, across my YouTube. It is very small, uh, I know, but there's been a lot of interest in this topic. So if you have an interest in underwater photography or anything Olympus or adventure travel kind of photography, videography, all that kind of stuff, don't forget to hit that subscribe button below and maybe the notification bell and you'll be able to hear about all of the new content that I have planned around those topics. Now it's no secret that I absolutely love underwater photography. For those of you who have been following along already, you know that I am in the water a lot of the time and I photograph models, I photograph whales, wildlife, all different types of scenes and I absolutely love it. And I'm a free diver, uh, I teach underwater photography, I'm a scuba diver as well, which I don't do all that much anymore, but yeah, I absolutely love the water. And there's no real secret uh, why people are drawn to uh, to the ocean and to this type of photography when they see it in awards or in magazines. Uh, it's a very niche type of photography. Uh, not everyone can do it because it's pretty adventurous. Uh, it requires a lot of expensive gear, uh, technical know-how on how to shoot it and how to post-process it. So hopefully in this series of videos that I aim to aim to release over the, uh, the coming months, uh, you'll be able to get an understanding too of how you might be able to uh, start out in this topic of photography. Now this video is going to be focused more on the beginner side of uh, underwater photography. If you're a professional or maybe an amateur or a keen amateur who has got a good understanding of photography on the, on the land, um, can be portraits, could be any landscape, whatever, as long as you've got an understanding of how the camera works and maybe you're already venturing into the semi-automatic or manual modes, then this type of video will be good for you. It will have a few of the basic types of um, or some basic information as well for those people really starting out, but this is not so much geared towards the people who are shooting just on GoPro or on their possibly their mobile phone and things like that. It's more for people who are really wanting to maybe in, take that next step in their underwater photography and they might have already started with a thing like a GoPro. So I'm going to split this video into two sections. I was originally going to just do one, uh, how to choose an underwater camera, but I thought, well, it's one thing to have the camera, but you really need to understand on the features of the housing and how that will relate to your type of photography and how it uh, fits in with your lens and your camera choice. So the first part of this video is going to be about how to choose your camera. And the second part would be on how to choose the housing or the type of housing that will pair with that camera. Now, this is not the be all end all in uh, choices. These are just my personal opinions. And I'm to be honest, I haven't used a great deal of other, other brands, but I have a lot of friends who do have different types of uh, cameras and brands and full frame uh, DSLRs, mirrorless, all of that type of jazz. So I have gotten to hear about the different quirks that they have uh, and positives and negatives of those systems. As with most of my videos, because they tend to get a little bit longer, uh, I will leave uh, timestamps in the description so you will be able to just skip through and go to a different part of the video or rewatch something that you may have uh, missed. So I really highly suggest that you start from the start and go to the end at least once so then you can take down some notes. So what I'm going to do is I'm also going to leave little markers throughout the video where I want you to pause the video and then take down notes that are relevant to you. So what I want you to do is get a piece of paper like this. And if you can see here, oh no, I want you to divide it into three columns. The first is going to be the topic. So the topic might be some, some settings that the camera might have. The info, this info section is where I want you to put all the information that I, am, or the main information that I'm telling you. So you can have those that um, set out there. And then the most important column on the right hand side is how does it relate to me? Okay, so it's all well and good to have all of this information, but you need to now start to think about how does this piece of information or this feature of a camera or housing or topic relate to the type of photography that you are wanting to get into. And this is where I want you to put this information because right at the end, you're going to go through and you're gonna write down all of the points here as a list. And then you can really hone in on the type of uh, housing, the type of setup that you're going to need because it is quite expensive or it may not be, okay? You might see that, oh, actually I don't need something really, really big and expensive. Um, because you've noted them all down already. So you will see a lot of my images as well uh, scattered out throughout this uh, tutorial. I do aim on doing a how to edit 
type of video as well. All of the images are edited with my presets as well, so if you wanted to skip that step, uh, I use these in my commercial work all the time. Pretty much one click for Lightroom, so the link will be in the description below. Also, if you have any other topics or things that you might uh, want answered or questions, because undoubtedly you're gonna have a lot of questions, drop those in the comments below as well, and I will endeavor to get back to you as soon as possible. So first up, what is an underwater camera or housing and why do we need it? Well, basically it is just a camera by itself that's in a shell that can go in the water, be submerged or it's sealed from the outdoors. Uh, so people use those for dusty, uh, sandy, uh, diving, uh, out in the rain, those sort of things. It's protected from rain and there's different levels of waterproofness. Now some of the cameras like the Olympus TG6 Tough, which I'll show you soon, those ones are fully waterproof already down to a certain, certain limit. Uh, your GoPros will come in a shell that can go down to a certain limit as well. And then you get into the bigger cameras that have the housings and they can go down even further. So there's all types of different underwater housings and camera types that are suited for different depths and different purposes. Now people, why do people use them? Well, basically it's to get these really cool shots to uh, under the water in really harsh conditions that your normal camera would just, just cannot do. And because it is so niche and expensive generally and difficult to get down to. But as you'll see though, throughout this video, the levels of ease in these different systems and different options are going to really uh, play a part in how easy it is for you to get photos. Now you might be really, really skilled in photography, but if you've got the wrong gear for underwater photography or for the type of photography you're going to do underwater, then it could really inhibit what types of images you'll end up with. All right, first of all, considerations. So this is where we're going to start with our sheet. Okay, the considerations. What do you want your camera for or housing for? Are you going to be using it professionally? Do you want to somewhere down the line use it professionally? Or perhaps you just want to take it on a snorkeling trip with your family maybe once a year. So these are the types of things you need to start thinking about because there's no point investing thousands and thousands of dollars in a system that is just going to sit there and do nothing, okay? Because they're also quite big and heavy. So what do you want your system for? Are you going to be selling prints? Are you going to be shooting models? Are you going to be trying to film or photograph wildlife? Write those points down. If you're thinking that you might be just wanting them for casual shots, then portability is the key. So write those points down. Portability is key for you. Are you going to be shooting video or stills? Or are you going to be shooting both? Because some cameras have better features for video and underwater uh, video and accessories that we'll talk about soon. And some are more geared towards just stills um, types of images. So have a think about, are you shooting just stills, just video or both? Also consider what type of diving you'll be doing. Now I started off with scuba diving because it allowed me to take a lot more time under the water and, and really compose. But in the end, I found it was actually a lot more difficult because you would ha always have to get all of this gear. It was such a time consuming thing. You have to carry so much, uh, there's so much set up. So I went into free diving and I've never looked back. To be honest, I've got my advanced scuba and I haven't done that for years now because free diving is just so accessible it's easy to slap on your wetsuit mask snorkel grab your grab your camera and you just jump in now there is also not just your underwater housing for diving you can also get your surf housing and we're going to talk about that as well some people want a housing that can withstand the pummeling of big waves and get some of those really cool surf shots that you might see here However, leaning more towards the dive-centered housings and cameras in this uh, how-to. But just know that these surf housings can be used underwater uh, for diving as well, but they do have their limitations and disadvantages in that genre. Now I want you to consider your budget because let's be honest, these things are not cheap. There are really good budget options out there, but for the people who are wanting to take the next step, you're going to just have to really invest. And unfortunately, some of these housings cost more than the cameras themselves. What is your budget? And is this going to be a business purchase or is this going to be a personal purchase? Have a think about the maximum you do want to spend to be able to get great images in the water and have to spend no more. Now with the prevalence of really, really cool smartphones out there that are waterproof to a certain level, you may be inclined just to use something like that and put a case around that. Now, there are great options for that as well. You can have a plastic bag kind of case, 
or you can get something like the Axis Go, which I'll leave in the description below if that's something you might like to do. Modern phones, I'll show you as well, can shoot raw. They're really, really cool, but they're not necessarily great for freezing action, which we will be trying to do with our big setup. And as you can see from this photo, I actually took, uh, I was doing a job for Oppo and they released their Find X2 Pro and I went out with uh, my good friend M. It was, it was actually really, really difficult. I went away at home and I thought I didn't get any photos. I was going flicking through on the couch, going to delete something and found this, that it actually worked. So you can get great shots. This was shot in RAW, uh, but that was super, super difficult to get and I wouldn't try it again unless I was really, really needed to. I would prefer just to take my housing out or just a point and shoot camera that was already set up for underwater. So if you already have something, you already have a camera, you have a lens, and you're really wanting to get into this, so I want you to write down the camera system that you have already or that you may want, and I want you to also write down the wireless lens that you have or that you may, uh, that you can get for this camera or perhaps the next camera that you're looking to purchase. And I want you to write the prices down there as well. So we're, now we're going to start considering all of those things and how they work together for you. But first, what do I use? Now, it's, I'm an Olympus ambassador, so I do use Olympus gear, and I also use it uh, to teach with. So my weapon of choice is this camera here, and this is the Olympus uh, EM1 Mark II or EM1 Mark III. It does fit inside it. Housing, it's proprietary housing, so that means that Olympus actually made it, so it is super, super, um, well made, it's relatively light. Uh, I put a, where is it? My EM1 Mark II inside it with a Olympus 7 to 14 mil lens and pretty much all of my shots these days are taken with this, with this setup. And that's basically all I need. I put this inside here and I'm off. I also do teach people with this and that's, this is the EM5 Mark II two inside the housing you can see this port is a little bit different it is actually a flat port um, great little camera this is a great starting point as well we'll talk about that later and I also recommend to a lot of people who are starting out in underwater photography or looking for a camera that can kind of do it all and they don't want to spend much uh, but it also has the ability to be expanded later on I recommend these little cameras and these are the Olympus TG6s brilliant brilliant cameras they're very very well known in the underwater world and used all around the world um, because of their macro abilities there they can shoot raw they can film in 4k as well so they're a really good budget options we'll also talk about those soon now there is a huge plethora of different cameras and lenses out there that can be used underwater basically any camera can be used underwater if it's put in the right casing however there are some systems such as the olympus am1 mark ii and uh, like the Sony a7 III, uh, some of the Fujis, especially the older ones. Um, most cameras can be used underwater, but there are brands that there are certain models that are really, really supported well in the different across the different brands of underwater housings uh, and lens ports. And one of the beauties of shooting underwater photography is sensor size doesn't necessarily matter as much as possibly on land when you're shooting portraits and you require a big shallow depth of field because under the water we don't really need a depth of field as such some people might be doing that with portraits but for this type of shooting that we're going to be doing and that i do i actually want a really really um narrow depth of field so i can keep everything nice and sharp if i miss focus because things move very very quickly so the advantages of having a micro four thirds system actually is beneficial underwater and I haven't really shot, I mean, I've shot at night, I use a torch, but there aren't many situations when I actually need something with really, really low light gathering abilities. And if I am, then usually the water is too murky and I probably won't be out there shooting anyway. So I type, obviously when you go out to shoot, you want the clearest, cleanest water possible. And naturally that's when the light is, is the best anyway. So. High ISO shooting is not really an issue. I shoot at ISO 6400 all the time. I teach all my students that don't be scared of ISO. It's better to get something sharp than blurry uh, with a lot of noise that we can fix in post after. It's no big issue. So you need to consider if you're going to be shooting a full frame, already a bigger camera, a bigger lens kit, especially if you're going to be using a big wide fast lens, 
that housing is going to be even bigger, especially if you're using a full-on uh, dive housing with arms and, and mounts. Uh, these are going to be heavy. Even my little camera with inside its housing gets quite heavy on the wrist when you're carrying around in the water. No big issue because most of them are buoyant. All right, let's get into the types of features you want to look for in a camera that is going to be used for underwater photography. So this is where we get our sheet again. We're going to do camera features. I'm going to write some of the info that I'm talking about and then the types of features that you might need or maybe your camera has or doesn't have that you think that you might uh, need to look for in your next camera purchase. So number one, your camera must be able to shoot raw. Why do we need to be able to shoot raw? Because when we're underwater, when light hits the surface of the water and goes through, it starts to lose all of its red, yellow, um, and orange colors and works its way through uh, down the spectrum actually, the deeper that it gets. So if you are shooting in JPEG, your camera is interpreting what white balance you, it thinks the scene will be. We cannot get all of the data back if it gets it wrong on our computer. If we shoot raw, it doesn't really matter what our white balance is, if the light's changing, we can get the maximum amount of data to edit it in post-production. Now, anyone who thinks that they're going to be shooting JPEGs or not doing any editing in post-production, I'm sorry, but you've got it wrong. You need to be able to edit a raw image in post-production when you're shooting underwater photography because the white balance and light is going to cause havoc. So if your camera can shoot raw or if it doesn't, you need to figure that out. Now, at the very, very minimum, if your camera doesn't shoot raw and you don't really want to get a, another camera, find a camera that can, or have a look and see if your camera has an underwater mode for white balance. Now, most cameras do, especially the ones that are oriented towards like the do it all kind of thing. I think GoPro might be able to do it. Even the Olympus cameras have that option too if you just want to shoot JPEG and don't want to edit. What that will do is it will warm up the scene, boost up some of the red, the magentas and the reds in there so you don't have a really blue washed out scene. All right, number two. You need to have a camera that has a really bright LCD or back screen. Why do we need to do that? Have a think about this. Have you ever taken your camera out in broad daylight and been trying to, to shoot and the sun's reflecting off the screen is really difficult to see? Well, consider this, if you're underwater, not only is the, the light going to be hitting your screen and reflecting, but it's also going to be hitting the screen that's on the housing. So now you have two levels of reflection that are going to be occurring. Then you've also got your goggles on. So that's three levels of glass or plastic that the light has to bounce around to. Uh, and then you also have the water. Now the water is going to be refracting and diffracting light differently and it's also going to cause distortion. So you've got these four things that are going to really, really inhibit how you perceive the image. So having a bright screen that can be changed to live view boost is really, really beneficial. If you don't have live view boost, that's fine, but the ability to use a, a live screen view um, that displays all your information, and especially a histogram. Write that down. If you have a histogram, I'm not gonna go too much into it. Uh, they'll save that for another video, but if you have a histogram, make sure you set it and turn it on. Do some research on how to use a histogram because that is what you want to be exposing with. So you might say, hold on, but I've got a viewfinder. I use the viewfinder in daylight, so I don't have to use the back LCD screen. Well, that's all well and good, but on a housing, The viewfinders are actually really, really difficult to use and you're not actually going to be able to use them. When I have my mask on, you're trying to look through that viewfinder and it is super difficult to do because all of your peripherals have been taken away. What you want to be able to do is with your mask on, be able to look at the back and be able to see everything that's around you as well. A, for safety. B, to see where your subject is, is moving and how the current's taking them. And C, just because that little viewfinder is terribly small and difficult to use. So trust me, use the LCD screen, set it to just be always on, and if you have a boost mode, turn that on as well.
By the way, these goggles are brilliant. Um, I'm going to do another video on all of the types of equipment you need for underwater photography, but just quickly, this is a Salva Manoa. There's a reason why so many people use this. Uh, it might be expensive to start off with, but it's the only mask you'll ever need. It's low volume, has uh, very, very low distortion, uh, super good for free diving and travel, and another pro tip. Don't be fooled into getting a set of goggles that has polarization in it. Yes, it does make your view really, really clear, but that actually tricks your eyes into seeing something a lot more vivid and clearer than what your camera might be able to see. So get something that's clear, low volume like this. I'll leave this in the description below. And also just a regular J-tube, soft. Don't get one of those ones with the valves on the top. They're, they're useless for what we want here. You want something super lightweight, clean, easy, and cheap. Next up, lens selection. You want to have a camera or lens set up that is wide. Not narrow, wide. Now we're not talking about surf photographers here. Yes, some of these people uh, using the cameras and lenses in surf photography are using zoom lenses. For us underwater, we're battling with orange, yellow, and red light being filtered out really, really quickly. We want to be as close to the subject as possible, so as wide as possible. Uh, we'll also make everything look a lot, not only a lot more vividly uh, warm and bring back skin tones, but it'll also exaggerate how big things are as well. And that's what the, the real underwater look everyone wants to go for. So that's why I use the Olympus 7 to 14 mil. So that's the equivalent of 14 to 24 mil f2.8 uh, in a 35 mil equivalent. And that's super wide. Sometimes I do use a fisheye. A lot of people use a fisheye as well. But try and get something that is in the mark of 14 to 24 mil um, across the board. This lens also is zoomable. So I have a zoom ring on here that works inside my housing. So if I do want to get in something a bit tighter, which I never really do, I have that option to turn it. There's some great uh, third party primes out there. So you don't need to get something made by Sony. You don't need to get something made by Canon. Whatever the brand it is, you can get something much cheaper and something that will do just as great, good a job. Just make sure that it will fit inside your housing, which we'll talk about soon. You also want a lens that doesn't have an aperture ring, that doesn't have an aperture adjustment on the lens. Why? Because when it's inside your housing, you will have no access, or usually have no access, to change the aperture. And that's something that we always change in, which we'll talk about soon. So pick a lens that the aperture is adjusted internally, so by, by using a dial, not an aperture ring here. So a lot of the cinema glass that you can get these days in some manual focus uh, lenses, not very, very useful. Also, a manual focus lens, not so useful as well. If you're diving, yes, and doing macro, but for the type of photography that I do, I want something with autofocus and the ability to, to lock into manual focus electronically rather than mechanically. So if you're using Olympus Glass Pro Tip, that little focus clutch fly-by-wire engages it into manual focus. When you're putting in the housing, make sure that that is in autofocus because I have gotten in so many times, even in my lessons when I've told my students, make sure that focus ring is in auto and I've forgotten to check it myself. So make sure that is engaged to autofocus. So if you are looking into surf photography, you want something that can be able to shoot wide. So the popular focal length is also 50 mil and sometimes up to 200 mil. These are things you need to consider when you're going to get your housing. So pause there, go back if you need to, write down what are the lenses that you have, what are the features of your lens that you already have or that you might think you need for your type of photography, and then we'll move on. Number three, you want a camera that has the ability to shoot manual. And I'm not talking about manual focus, I'm talking about manual modes or at the very least semi-automatic modes. Why? Because we want ultimate control of how we're controlling light and our aperture and shutter speed. It is scary, I know, but if you're going to be delving into the underwater world, you're not going to be going into it as an absolute complete beginner and expecting to get nailed really, really unique and, and wild kind of shots in wild conditions. You just won't. You have to be honing your skills on land and in the shallow and in basic situations 
learn how to use manual mode, learn how to use aperture priority mode, which is what I teach most of my students how to use. And you also wanna be able to have the ability to be able to change the ISO as needed. Now I'm going to do a video, I think, on my best settings that I use all the time general settings for underwater photography so if you think that, that might be something that you are interested in drop a comment below and i'll hopefully get that one to you all right number four we want a camera that can shoot burst and has great autofocus now burst why well it's not like you're going to be out in the backyard taking a photo of your dog and you get multiple choices if your uh, chances to shoot it if you're out shooting whales or you've got a model and it's cold things like that you are going to get another chance to get that shot. You might only have 20 seconds. So you want to be shooting burst and dealing with all the data later. For instance, when we're in Tonga, I have two cards in here. They're backing up all the time. So if I shoot into one, it's backing it into the second one. And I am just shooting high speed burst getting these whales because I may not see them again and I may miss a shot. It's worth going in and just deleting all of the stuff after. Um, that you don't want. But if you're investing in a big setup like this, you're also going to be investing in good memory cards. Now I use SanDisk Extreme Pro 64 gigs, but on bigger jobs, I will also use the 128 gigabyte versions. They're expensive, they're ultra high speed too, class 10, but they can deal with the buffer speeds that you might need for that type of shooting. If you're just going to be shooting, maybe just models or just fa family kind of things, just snorkeling, just go with um, a 64 gigabyte card, maybe 170 megabits a second uh, write speed. I'll leave li uh, links in the description below. That's all you really need. But for the level of stuff I need and for things like whales and stuff, I would get a good card that can read write very, very quickly for your burst modes. Now, your burst modes, does your camera have it? Write that down. We need to see, does it have a low speed burst? Does it have a high speed burst? And if it does, what are those numbers and do they work in continuous modes? Getting into continuous modes. I shoot in continuous autofocus 99% of the time. If you're going to be doing scuba diving, you might shoot single point, which um, because you'll have more of the time at the bottom of the ocean to compose and hold things still. But for the type of free diving and shooting that I do, and for most of you, I think you will want to be shooting something with continuous autofocus. These cameras are great. You want to be able to have an autofocus point that is movable from the center to a small square in here. So I'm just gonna look at my monitor here, a small square, and potentially have autofocus points that fill the whole frame. I don't use those all the time though, because the camera, can get tricked with sediment in the water. So a continuous autofocus mode in your camera and lens that can at least have a little box in the, in the middle that you can move around and compose the scene. Number six, okay, you want a camera that can also have customizable buttons. Why? Because sometimes when we put them into housings, these buttons don't always line up. And some of the features that you might use on your camera on land may not be any use to you underwater. So if you can change some of the modes or even like on my camera here, I've got custom modes. I can actually map everything uh, to land or to underwater. And then when I go, okay, I'm just gonna go for a dive. I turn it to custom three. It's got everything mapped for my underwater photography and all the buttons are now mapped differently to my housing. It's not a deal breaker if you can't do this, but it's something to consider uh, most of the uh, prosumer, uh, even the amateur cameras will have customizable buttons. But once you start to think about their housing, which we'll talk about soon, then you'll see that your style of photography and the things that you're going to shoot will really, really come down to play on how quickly you can navigate your camera and buttons. One of the other reasons why you want to be able to customize your camera is to turn on back button focusing. Now I'm not going to go into back button focusing. There's plenty of videos out there on why um, how to set it up and why we want to do it, but you should really look into it because I use it all the time and for underwater photography, especially with the Olympus housing, it is invaluable. And that just means instead of pressing the half shutter here to focus and holding it here, we actually use our thumb on the focus button here and I can keep holding it continuous. There's the whale, there's the model. I can move around with the motion of the ocean and keep things in focus and when I'm ready to shoot, bang, bang, bang. If you're doing this in the ocean with uh, 
with your normal finger trigger, that is extremely hard to keep things in focus when the light is changing with the, the way things are moving in the ocean. And it's really, really taxing on your hand. I have small hands to try and hold that. So if you can set up back button focusing, that is a plus. All right, number seven. I hope I've got these numbers right because I'm getting really, really confused. Number seven, these are miscellaneous things that may not uh, be really, really important, but if you're looking to upgrade into a pro level type of system, then these are definitely things that I think are necessary. As I mentioned before, I think you should get a camera that can shoot dual memory cards and write to them all the time because if one memory card fails when you're out on a trip in Tongarum shooting an underwater documentary, pardon me, or you're out with a model, one memory card fails, you can't just go, it's not very, very easily to just go back on shore or change memory card. And especially you do not want to open your housing when it is wet, because as soon as a little droplet gets in there, you're going to get, um, going to start to get condensation inside when you put it back in, especially if you're shooting in really, really cold or really, really hot environments, um, you're going to encounter problems. I use those little silica gels. I'll put uh, a link in the description below. They are really, really invaluable to keep fog from starting in your lens. So one of the reasons why we have to open it is because our memory cards failed or full. If you've got two memory cards in there, it's so much easier to continue shooting and if your battery's charged. Also mentioned before, if your housing or if your lens setup has a zoom function, that is really, really handy. Um, Having a, a fast zoom I think is more beneficial than having a really sharp prime when you're underwater just because of the versatility, having a, a do it all without having to open up the housing. Now surf photographers, if you're using a surf housing, you're going to have an enormous amount of planning to do for each shot because it is not very easy just to keep swapping things out because you're going to be using wing nuts to keep everything nice and tight. Dive housings, a bit different. All right, so pause there before we get into the housing. Go through, compile your notes, have a think about the features that your camera has or may not have. And I want you to have a think about the type of shooting that you might be interested in and see if those points marry up to anything that you already have. All right, now we're moving on to the section on how we're going to choose our housing and the types of features that we're going to be looking for. Now, as I mentioned before, housings are extremely expensive and there's varying levels of quality that you can get with them. Now, some people might be really, really tempted to skimp and just get one of those um, plastic bag style, plastic bag style housings for the camera. And I'm, I have not actually used them. I think they are quite a good option if you're just going to be in a swimming pool or just bobbing around at the shallows where you're taking some holiday snaps. But for pure functionality and, and ease, uh, peace of mind when putting a really expensive camera and lens system inside a housing, sorry, under the water, I want something that I know is going to survive. I also mentioned before that there's multiple types of housings. So let's have a quick overview on the different types and how they affect the types of shooting that you're able to do. The first of all, which we're covering mainly because this is the type of stuff I do, is the dive housing. Now, this dive housing, as I said, is proprietary to Olympus. Uh, you'll notice this one's made out of plastic. Some are made out of uh, aluminium. Um, there's also different features of some of the, the dive housings. They've got uh, flood warnings, uh, pressure valves, all this type of stuff. You'll see on the front of this housing, it's got a dome port, which we'll talk about soon. Um, this is the actual housing itself. It has a ring. This is an extension tube, which we'll also talk about before. And then the, le the lens end hit fits on the end. These types of housings are a bit more ergonomically useful for all types of shooting because they're, pr they're pretty tough. It has an O-ring seal inside here, as you can see. And in here, so we need to Close that and that's going to create the seal. Inside here we've got our silica gels, camera slots in there, everything just kind of works nice and easily. Now these housings can be rated for depths anywhere from five meters all the way up to, I think this one's like 60 meters, so it's super deep. Um, however, they are not the best for surf photography. A, because they're not as tough if they get if they get smashed onto rocks they probably won't survive as well as a proper surf housing they also don't have a pistol grip that a surf housing will have 
So when you're bobbing in the water in the surf, um, you'll be able to hold the camera with one hand and shoot with the other with the grip and get more shots like that. A surf housing is also going to have more buoyancy. Now, what does that mean? Well, it will float a lot more. And for us, when we're free diving, we don't want super buoyant um, housings because it, we're fighting the buoyancy of our housing and it's causing us to use more energy and therefore more energy is less time down below. The surf housings are also going to be made from like complete metal, aluminium, uh, really super, super tough, can take a beating, but they also don't have access to a lot of the buttons. They'll have the main ones like the, the shoot or um, maybe change your aperture in some of the dials, but they're not going to be as functional as having a full on dive housing. You can still use these in the surf, but I just wouldn't be taking them in anything like a six foot surf because they probably will get broken and there's a risk of flooding. A dive housing is also going to be a lot more modifiable. Now, what does that mean? Well, as you can see up here, we've got hot shoe, I'm oh, sorry, cold shoe mounts. Um, and we've also got the ability to start using strobes. Now, we can strap things on, um, I have a bracket, I don't know where it is, a bracket that goes under here, which is used for scuba diving, then you can start using strobes and video lights, stuff like that. I don't tend to use that though for free diving because it creates drag. I like having something super compact and easy for me to maneuver around and doesn't slow me down in the water. But just know that dive housings, if you're going to start doing macro photography, video work, or use it for scuba diving in dark areas, you're going to need a housing that has some, has mounting points and the ability to build it up later. But it's also, it's going to get more expensive. Then there are options like our TG6. Now this little thing is waterproof already. I think down to 10, 50, here, let's have a look here waterproof down to 15 meters already. So that just means you don't actually need to buy anything else but this camera. It's going to be able to shoot everything you need underwater down to 15 meters. And to be honest, most marine life sits at about the 10 meters to the surface anyway. Um, and most of the good light is there as well. So this little thing is going to get you out of trouble. The beauty of having something like this is that you can also buy a housing for it. The housing just makes it a little bit more functional, much like this one, but it also allows the camera to withstand more depth pressure. So you'll be able to, if you are going to be scuba diving to something below 15 meters, then you can grab a housing, they're relatively cheap. There's a few online, they're plastic, they're lightweight. You can also add strobes to it. So a camera like this TG6 is the reason why I recommend this to so many people who are starting out and want a camera that can kind of do it all and maybe testing the waters to see if they like this type of photography. A couple of my friends also have a thing like the Axis Go, which I mentioned before, and that takes, sits on top of your iPhone, covers your iPhone, and allows you to dive, I can't remember how deep it is, but possibly something like 15 meters. The functionality of them is okay. Uh, I think they're great for like holiday snaps and maybe little surf types of shots because you can use a pistol grip. But for the type of photography I do, I need something a little bit more rugged, robust, and functional that I know is going to work that has mechanical buttons rather than just touchscreen functionality and tiny little buttons on the top uh, of a phone. So another consideration when you, no matter what housing you're going to get, you're going to need a case to carry it in. I carry mine around in my old F-stop case here because my housing fits perfectly inside that. Um, what I do wish though is I had something like the Cine bag, which I will leave in the description below. Uh, that way you can actually carry your bag and uh, some of the lenses and some of the other, your little accessories inside it. But it's also waterproof so you can fill it with uh, fresh water and dunk it in. Another consideration, they're not cheap, but I think that's going to be my next purchase uh, because you do not want to get salt water uh, inside the dials and buttons of these things. It will ruin them if you leave them to dry. So we're gonna take a pause, we're gonna review. So what type of shooting are you going to be doing predominantly? I know we talked about it with the cameras, but do you think that you're going to mainly do dive photography, snorkeling, portraits, maybe wildlife, or do you think you might be predominantly going to be shooting stuff in the surf? All right, point two of our housings lens selections and ports. So this is directly related to our wide angle lens that we have decided to choose for our camera. Now that we've already written down what lens we have or what we might uh, want, we know we want something in the range of 14 to 24 millimeters. You need to choose a housing that 
can accommodate that lens. Previously, before I had this lens port, I used to have on my AM1 Mark II, I used to have a 12 mil, which is equivalent to 24 mil prime, which also could use my eight mil fisheye in there. So some ports and port extension tubes um, can actually accommodate multiple types of lenses. So once you write down all the lenses you have or might want to consider using, you can start to try and match them up with the roadmap of the particular brand and see if they have a setup that might be within your budget and that will cover all types of focal lengths and lenses that you put inside. Consider the bigger the lenses that you're putting in here as well, as likely the more expensive your port extension tubes will end up being. It can get really, really confusing. Even I get confused looking at the Olympus roadmap and I have to um, email Olympus and ask what type of ports will work with this. You can put other lenses in um, some of these ports that may not necessarily show up on any of the roadmaps. These are the problems you have because obviously it's very, very tricky to just try it out and you don't want to just buy something and it doesn't work. But I've been kind of lucky. I have tested different lenses in these cameras and I have, sorry, in these housings and they have actually worked. When building out your housing, you also need to consider the type of port that you're going to use. Now there are multiple different types of ports and they're all useful for different styles of photography. I have a dome port on here. Why is it called a dome port? Well, you can see here that it's actually a dome. And now this one I think is the six inch dome, which is quite small. You can usually get an eight inch dome all the way up to these ridiculous Aquatech domes that are like 16 inches. You see here Jordan Robbins actually uses them and they're really, really useful for those epic 50-50 split uh, shots because if you're in the water, the water lines here, a slight movement is going to cover your entire lens. But if you've got a giant dome, any movement of the water is not going to make a huge difference so you can get super creative but they're more expensive and they're also going to be really, really difficult to travel with. Typically dome ports are used for really, really wide angle lenses because they help cover um, the wider field of view. If you notice on this one here, which is on the EM5 Mark II, uh, it's got a inside here, that's got a 50 mil lens equivalent inside here and it uses a flat port. Now these aren't as useful for split 50-50 shots because the water doesn't bead over them as much. But they're ultra compact, um, really good for macro type of photography or potentially portrait photo um, photography where you're not as close to your model. But they generally end up being a bit cheaper because there's actually less glass. Another thing to consider when you're choosing your port is whether you want a glass dome or acrylic. Now the glass is obviously heavier and more expensive, but it's optically going to be much, much better than an acrylic port. And acrylic is just the plastic ports. The issue with the acrylic is after a while, they can start to, especially when you're cleaning them, if you're not taking care of them, they can start to get some fine scratches on there and end up looking um, crap. So basically they don't last as long, but they are cheaper and they are optically quite good if you look after them, but it's something you need to take into consideration. And start to consider maybe what size dome you might need to use. Most of my images are taken with this dome. So you can have a look at the types of shots I can get with this. And this is a great travel size. You can see it's quite big, but it's still nowhere near as big as having an eight inch or a 16 inch dome. All right, point three. This is button layout and customization. And can you can see a bit of a pattern here. They're, they're lining up with the section I talked about on button customization with our cameras. Now, with our housing, because the housing is actually so big, I actually have tiny hands, I want to be able to operate this as easily as possible. The beauty of having a proprietary housing like this is most, I have functionality of every single function on this camera except the front two little buttons just here. So that means I can now map all of my features to different buttons on here that will really benefit how I the types of stuff I shoot. And I, as I mentioned before, I use back button focusing, which is this button just here. So my AEL. Now the problem is with mapping is with that being my autofocus, that button corresponds to my housing just here. Now, if you're holding this, look how far I actually have to stretch to be able to press that button and focus. 
no good. So, on my housing, where's a natural place do you think that I can press my button? Well, function one just here. So now I can hold my housing here, hold my finger on focus, shoot, shoot, shoot. So this is why marrying up customizable buttons on your camera to your housing, I can now map that autofocus button to function one button here, which lines up with my housing function one button here. So if possible, when choosing your housing, it's great to be able to hold it in your hand, maybe bring your camera down to the shop and then try and figure out where all of the buttons are. Try and get, if you can't do that, get some pictures online, zoom into it and have a look around how the ergonomics of your housing uh, match up with your camera and the size of your hands and the type of shooting you're going to be using. If you're using a surf housing, you might be able to use a grip. But for here, all of my buttons are in a nice, easy place to access. There are multiple different housings out there, so Aquatex, Sea Frogs, um, Icolite, all of those things, they're going to have different ways to access buttons. Some of them are going to be using levers. Some of them are going to have buttons say up here that work on button on functions on the camera down below. Everything's going to be different and some I think don't have great layouts to them. So this is why it's really important to do your research beforehand, maybe look on forums and ask questions about how people are dealing with um, accessing some of those features. And our last point on housings. Sorry, I know this is taking a while. We want the potential to add extra accessories. Now this is not so much important for me in my type of shooting in freediving because all I pretty much use is this and this brilliant um, Axis Go which is made by um, Aquatech. I'll leave this in the description below. Originally I had just a... Uh, originally I just had this crappy little uh, wrist strap that came from Olympus and actually cuts the circulation off your hand so much. Um, useless. So I bought this nice neoprene one. There's not much buoyancy to this. Some of the ones you might see on Amazon and eBay are actually going to have a float in it and they're no, no useful. They are no use for you when you're shooting underwater because they're going to be creating some, some buoyancy, which we don't want. This one's a nice, light one, it's comfortable to carry, minimal space. So we did touch on it before, if you're going to be doing scuba diving, you want the ability to add extra items onto here, our arms, our strobes, our uh, our bracket frame that we can hold onto and get a, a, and swim with easier when we're scuba diving. Some of the other dive ports also have wet uh, lens changes so you can actually change lenses underwater if you need to. So that wraps up the housing selection. Now that's been a lot of information, no, it's quite long, but hopefully you've been able to jot down notes that are related to the type of shooting that you have, your budget, um, how often you're going to be shooting, the level at which you're going to be shooting, the functionality. And now you've got a list. I want you to write down all of the things that were in this into a, onto a separate piece of paper, all of the features that you want or need in a lens, camera and housing setup. And then you can start to research the different brands that are online and available and seeing whether these match up or maybe you need to purchase something different. So if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. If you found this useful, don't forget to uh, give me a thumbs up because it really does help get this information out to more people. If you'd like to know anything else about underwater photography, also drop those in the comments below. I, I'm sure there's going to be lots and lots of questions and my recommendations. Uh, as I said, I only shoot the Olympus stuff. Uh, I really highly recommend at least getting something like this TG6 because it is just so handy to have. Um, but if you're looking to get a pro level kit that won't break the bank with a, a completely brand new full frame system and lens, something like the EM1 Mark II or EM1 Mark III with this seven to 14 mil lens and this housing can't be beaten. Like you can see the shots that we're getting out of it uh, and it's brilliant. So I will leave it at that uh, and I shall see you on the next one. Bye.